Uh, in about 1995, I read an article in JAMA uh, called Error in Medicine uh, by this very respected senior Harvard surgeon named Lucian Leap. And that was what got me first interested in this new field that I'd never heard of before called patient safety. And uh, I like to dream big, but the, I would not have dreamed uh, that uh, today I would be able to uh, be up here introduced by, by Lucian. Lucian, thank you so much. That was absolutely spectacular. Uh, it's just a great privilege and honor to be here. Uh, thank you uh, to the sponsors and, uh, and thank you to Mitz for all the fantastic work you do. Uh, Linda, I have to say a word. You, you, you said something that I, I sort of resonated with me. Uh, you said when you were up here before, you feel a profound responsibility to do something about it. Uh, that may be true, but I don't think many people would do what you have done. And I think it's just absolutely remarkable, and the fact that uh, all of you are here tonight is a testimony to uh, uh, Linda's sort of understated way of saying anybody would have done this. Well, not everybody would have done this. It's absolutely... It is, a, uh, it is a work of staggering generosity, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm awed by it. Um, in a, a half hour, I don't want to keep you uh, past the 9 o'clock witching hour, so I, I'm going to speak a little bit about my view of the field of patient safety over the past 10 years. Uh, as uh, Lucian mentioned, I just did the second edition of, of my book, Understanding Patient Safety. I actually had the opportunity to do it while on sabbatical in London, which was an absolute uh, delight. It's actually nice to do a book when you're on sabbatical because writing when you're not uh, doing it between answering emails, you can actually think a little bit. So um, I had a chance really six months ago to really think about the field and where we've come from and where we've gone. And I think it's helpful reflecting on that as we think about where we might be going. So that's what I want to spend a little bit of time with, uh, with you. And maybe I can get the slides up. That'd be great. There we go. So I've called this uh, Reflections on a Decade of Successes, Failures, Surprises, and Epiphanies. Uh, you will be pleased to know I'm not going to summarize a whole 400-page book in 30 minutes, but rather just focus on the things that I found most interesting, most surprising. And one of the things that, I've, uh, that struck me as I was putting this together was how many of the insights that we've gleaned from our work in patient safety I think are extraordinarily important in our work more generally in trying to improve health care. So, uh, and I'll, I'll point to some of those lessons as we go forward. One of the lessons, I think, and one of the lessons that, that we all understand in some ways celebrate here tonight is the importance of communication. And particularly as we think about this gulf that there has been traditionally between patients and, uh, and clinicians and the work that MITS has been doing to bridge it and the work that Tom has been doing to bridge it. I, I didn't learn until tonight that Tom was the winner of the, the, uh, the HOPE Award. Tom is an old friend and colleague and someone I admire greatly. Uh, this is really crucial work, this idea of bringing together two different groups that to some extent speak different languages. So let me start out uh, sort of reflecting on that. I did spend close to a year in the United Kingdom last year, and uh, this is a sign that uh, was put up in Wales a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, the sign says, of course, no entry for heavy goods vehicles, residential site only. Now, in Wales, Wales is one of those countries where they are trying to hold on to the old Welsh language. And so uh, here is the translation that they came up with in, in Welsh. I don't know how many of you speak Welsh, uh, but here it is. Now, the way they came up with this translation, it turned out the people that were putting on the, up the sign don't actually know Welsh. But the, the Wales government has a, uh, a basically a one-stop shopping place where you can call them and give them your language, and they will give you the translation. And so these folks, after they put up this sign, had the English uh, part of it. They called this number. Uh, they got a message. Uh, they heard the message. And they said, OK, there's our translation. It's good to go. And they put it on the sign. It was only later that they learned that in Welsh, uh, this translates back to English as, I'm not in the office at the moment. Please send any work to be translated. So sometimes I feel like when patients and clinicians talk to each other, we have a little bit of a disconnect like that. And I think the work of MITS really has been dedicated to trying to make sure that we are speaking the same language. Uh, the things I want to touch on briefly, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the pace of change. Some of you have seen me go through this before, but I think it's, it's useful to, to go through a brief timeline of the last 10 or 12 years. 
I'm going to talk about how uh, we have learned from patient safety something that's actually quite crucial in all of improvement in healthcare, the limitations of top-down approaches. I'm going to spend a moment on information technology and some of the unanticipated hazards that's, uh, that have grown out of IT. Uh, the the uh, overarching importance of culture, I think that was a new lesson for me at least uh, that I learned through the patient safety field. An issue that's really been a pet issue for me for the last several years, which is the need to balance this no-blame systems approach with accountability, and then I'm going to spend the last moment on dealing with change. So to my mind, even though I truly believe uh, that the patient safety field really began for medicine with the publication of Lucian's article uh, in JAMA in 1995, I don't think it really took off until the IOM report uh, that was published in December 1999. And you, of course, remember how that happened. That happened with the estimate drawn from the Harvard Medical Practice Study that uh, Lucian helped lead that showed that there were 44 to 98,000 deaths per year from medical mistakes in the United States, a big number that would have gotten some attention but probably would not have launched a movement had not someone clever uh, done uh, the most amazing bit of spin in the history of medicine probably, translating that into the now famous jumbo jet unit saying this would be the equivalent of a large plane crashing every day. That was the metaphor that launched the patient safety field. So when I talk about a decade of the patient safety field, this is really what I mean. I think the field really launched in earnest only 12 years ago with the publication of the IOM report. At the time of that publication, I think we thought, most people thought quality and safety were pretty good. Uh, there was precisely no business case to improve quality and safety. If you were a hospital CEO or, or a board and you were saying at the end of the year we have a few million bucks left over, you were making a perfectly reasonable business decision, putting up billboards, putting marble in the lobby, rather than investing in safety and quality. There was very little expertise in how to do this, and in part because of all this, there was very little concerted effort to improve safety. So with that, let me take you on a 12-year tour and, uh, and, and, and reflect on some of the changes that we've seen in the last 12 years. And the bottom line, to me, is this is a staggering amount of change and to some extent progress. It's not as fast as any of us would have liked. The changes are, uh, are, not, are not sticking as well as we would like. There are still patients being harmed in hospitals and clinics around the country today, and we can't stop until we fix that. But I think that what I've come to understand is I think there's been a lot of change. Let me take you through that. So I, I already mentioned the IOM report on safety was published in late 99. A year later, the same organization came out with the Quality Chasm Report talking about the really launching this new quality movement. Uh, here is a surgical retractor uh, left inconveniently inside someone's chest. Uh, in 2003, the, a new organization called the National Quality Forum, only four years old at the time, came out with a list of, of in the words of the founding head of NQF, Ken Kaiser, things that should, quote, never happen in healthcare. This became known as the Never Events List and ultimately became a scaffolding for a number of other policy initiatives, for example, not, not paying for them by Medicare, state reporting of these events in, in many states. Uh, this is Beth McGlynn. Beth is a researcher now working for Kaiser Permanente, but in 2003 she worked for the RAND Corporation. She published a major study in the New England Journal that said, when we know the right thing to do in healthcare, when the evidence is crystal clear, we do that thing 54% of the time. If that's too odd a number to try to remember, just remember a coin flip, that we get it right half the time, which of course is, uh, is unacceptable. I put the Joint Commission up here in 2004, 2005, not because it was new, it was 50 years old then, but the Joint Commission, in part because of the pressures that they were feeling from the safety movement, began to completely transform their processes. They began uh, issuing uh, these national patient safety goals and sentinel event alerts, uh, practices that they said every hospital in America should embrace. Uh, most of those, I think, were reasonable kinds of practices. Uh, probably just as importantly, up until 2004, if you work at a hospital, your hospital received about two years' notice that the Joint Commission was going to come to visit. And I can tell you in my hospital, I remember preparing for those visits with two years' notices. The floors were waxed beautifully. The medicines were all locked up. Uh, it was, I think, the most dangerous day in my hospital. The floors were slippery as hell. <laughs> and nobody could find any of the medications because they weren't where they usually were. Uh, starting in 2004, the Joint Commission switched their process, so now the hospitals in the United States get 
30 minutes notice of a Joint Commission visit. There are people in my hospital whose job on Monday morning is to go on the Joint Commission website at 7 o'clock in the morning to see if they're going to be in our lobby at 7.30. Now, I don't think the Joint Commission process is perfect, but I think it's reasonable. And if you were a patient or a family member and you said, this is the organization that is going to give the good housekeeping seal to this hospital, determining that it's safe, I don't want them to have two years notice. I want them to have 15 minutes notice just to make sure the right people are there in the lobby to greet them. So this happened in part because of the pressure that that organization was feeling to step up its game. About a year later, Medicare launched Hospital Compare, a website where they present essentially transparency, where they present data on the performance of hospitals, began with a couple of sort of process measures. Did you give aspirin to patients with heart attacks? Now includes a number of patient safety measures and certain outcomes. Here's Don Berwick. Uh, I see uh, Maureen is here from IHI, and, and, and uh, this is really reflects not only the amazing contributions that Don and IHI have made over the years, but I placed this in 2005, 2006, because this is when IHI launched the 100,000 Lives campaign, really leveraging social pressure. IHI had no regulatory pressure or accreditation pressure, really no authority to make anybody do anything. But when IHI came out with the credibility that it's built up over the years and said, here are a number of practices that we think every hospital should do, more than half the hospitals in the United States signed on the dotted line pledging to do those practices. Uh, this is my friend Peter Ponovos. Many of you know Peter's work. Peter's an intensivist at Johns Hopkins and really one of the uh, dominant leaders in, in, in the field of patient safety. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Peter's work in a few moments, but in 2006, 2007, he published the results of the remarkable work that he was doing in the state of Michigan, using checklists and a number of other activities to try to get uh, standard practices to try to prevent central line infections. It worked remarkably well uh, with uh, major decrease in the rate of central line infections, uh, hundreds and hundreds of lives saved, millions of dollars saved. Uh, this is uh, demonstrated to show the meaningful use incentive. So over the last couple of years, as you probably know, the federal government has rolled out a program where they're paying hospitals and doctors if they implement computer systems that meet certain standards. You may have read the New York Times today about whether those standards are, are strong enough, but uh, this to me I think is a reasonable approach given that information technology in healthcare was clearly a market failure. You didn't need federal incentives or federal push to get Walmart or United Airlines to computerize. The business case to do it was, was obviously more than enough to get them to do it. Healthcare wasn't working that way, and so this was the federal response to that partly, again, driven by the pressure to improve patient safety. And just rolling out last month was the beginnings of both value-based purchasing, using the payment system to try to promote safety and quality, as well as the penalties for readmissions. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. Uh, that's 12 years. If you'd asked me in December 1999 when the IOM report on safety came out, how much change will we see? How much change are we capable of both uh, 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 doing and then absorbing in this battleship called the American healthcare system? I never would have guessed this. This is a remarkable amount of change and pressure. It hasn't all worked perfectly. There have been some unanticipated consequences, but I think it is worth uh, reflecting on this and saying this is a pretty impressive amount of work and, and by a lot of different stakeholders. And I think what it says is when the patient safety field became a field with not only numbers but cases and drama and a moral argument and ultimately then economic arguments, accreditation pressures, essentially everybody stepped up their game. Everybody, whether you were an accreditor, a regulator, a hospital, a patient advocacy group, any, anybody who had anything to do with this said, I need to take this really much more seriously than I have. And I think the results are quite impressive. It hasn't worked as well as we would like, partly because it turns out to be pretty hard. It's not an easy problem to fix. It is multidimensional, and we've seen situations where we've learned that if you squeeze the balloon on one end, something else pops out. You know, it seems unambiguously like a great idea not to have residents working 120 hours a week and falling asleep driving home from work, as I did several times when I was a resident, and yet as we shrink the duty hours, we now are seeing many more problems with handoffs, so how do you fix that? I think that's the kind of, the nature of the problem. It's tougher than we thought it would be, but there certainly has been, a, the pace of change has been quite rapid. 
I'm gonna talk about the limitations of top-down approaches. I think those, of, those folks who studied the business literature probably understood this fairly well. Those of us who were just physicians knew nothing about this, and I think it has been one of the key lessons of the patient safety field. To talk about this, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the, the, the way Peter Kronovo's experiment went. Uh, this is the checklist work that led to a remarkable decrease in central line infections. Peter developed the idea of a checklist. Part of it was drawn from some of the work by IHI around, the, uh, around bundling a group of activities. If, if we're trying to do four or five different things to prevent a certain kind of harm, wouldn't it be clever to bundle it into one package and measure whether you did all of those things rather than just one? Once that became an idea, Peter had this notion that if we're trying to remember to do five things, let's see, when I go to the supermarket and try to remember to buy five things, what do I do? Oh yeah, I use a checklist. Uh, when I explain to lay people that the major epiphany in the patient safety field in the last 10 years was the use of a checklist, they, they're a little bit incredulous, but that is, that is the truth. So uh, Peter developed this idea of a checklist for central line infections, implemented it at a single ICU in Johns Hopkins, it worked very well, then brought it to the state of Michigan to more than 100 ICUs, it worked very well, demonstrated its effectiveness in a New England Journal study. It was popularized by Atul Gawande in an article in the New Yorker, ultimately in a book, The Checklist Manifesto. Atul and his colleagues extended the notion of checklists to surgery, and it worked equally well there. And over the last year or two, it's diffused around the government, around the country, now with federal support. Importantly, the federal support was fairly late in the game. This really began as an individual, very smart, very charismatic, very effective investigator. And, and, and leader coming up with this idea, trying it locally, seeing that it worked, and ultimately scaling it out first to Michigan and ultimately to the United States. It is the ultimate bottom-up intervention. And I think demonstrates what we have to do in patient safety. Now, who knows what the next checklist will be? I have no idea. But what I do know is it's probably going to look sort of like this. Somebody really smart and clever, seeing a problem on the ground, collaborating with other team members, coming up with a solution that they try in their own universe, it works, and then somehow scaling it up. And I have no idea whether that person will be a physician or a nurse or a patient or a family member or a lawyer or a social worker. Who knows? It should be whoever has that idea. So that's the message. Now, as I mentioned, I spent last year in the United Kingdom, and in the United Kingdom, this idea, the idea of a checklist-based intervention to prevent harm, arrived, as things tend to do in the National Health Service, via a federal mandate. So it was NPSA, that's National Patient Safety Agency, 2009-PSA-002-U1. That's how the checklist arrived in the United Kingdom, and it says organizations are required to, and basically all the lingo that you would expect around a checklist. And when I asked people in the United Kingdom, the docs and nurses, what do you think about this checklist idea? You probably know what they said. They said, another top-down mandate from the government. And the pushback against this idea of this checklist was actually quite profound. Because from where they sat, it looked like another government rule, as opposed to what it really began life as, which was an individual, entrepreneurial, bottom-up intervention that got scaled out. And it really taught me the importance of balancing. Now, some things need to be top down, but one of the key things that we need to do in patient safety is make sure that we have the soil and the environment where the next Peter Pronovos can come up with the next checklist and then build it up on their own unit and then scale it out. And it's easy to, uh, to get in the way of that. Uh, and I have to say, I, I went to the United Kingdom uh, as a good San Francisco liberal, expecting to love single payer the National Health Service. There are many things about it that I do came, came uh, to love, uh, mostly the fact that they spend 10% of their GDP on health care, not 18% like we do, uh, and that everybody has insurance. And it's just a non-issue. You go to see the doctor, and it is covered. I mean, those things are spectacular. But from the standpoint of kind of individual entrepreneurialism and individual initiative and bottom-up innovation, I've told friends that it, it, if, if you've ever worked at the VA and you know it feels a little bureaucratic sometimes, it makes the VA look like Facebook. Uh, it, it, and so we've got to be very careful as we come up with a more nationalized healthcare system that we, we make sure that we don't create too much of a top-down system. One of the things that this has taught us is this idea of complex adaptive systems and complexity theory. And you've seen here uh, sort of the idea that we can break down problems into three different buckets. Simple problems like baking a cake or choosing the right antibiotic, complicated problems like flying a rocket ship to the moon, 
or developing a better way to treat sepsis, and complex problems like raising a child or implementing a big information technology system. The importance of this is that the way you approach these different problems cannot be the same. A simple problem can be dealt with with a simple checklist and even a very prescriptive, you know, thou shalt do this. A complex problem can't be dealt with that way and if that's the way your instinct deals with it, you will screw it up. And I think that's something that's an appreciation that turns out to be very important for all of healthcare, not just patient safety, but I think it's one of the areas that patient safety taught us. Uh, and healthcare is a complex adaptive system. Here from Brenda Zimmerman are some of the aspects of complex adaptive systems we've learned, that the environment is constantly changing, uh, uncertainty and paradox are inherent. Problems can't be solved in machine-like fashion. You might be able to move them forward, but that's not the way that you're gonna solve them. It's messier than that. Individuals are independent, uh, but highly interdependent creative decision makers. Solutions often emerge from minimal specifications. And if you overspecify, it will get in the way. And most things fail. Most things will not succeed. And the way you improve is to try something and, it, and you learn from the experience and you iterate. I think this has been a lesson that at least I learned from the patient safety field and turns out to be very useful when you try to improve virtually anything. Third area that I, I've learned uh, that I didn't understand and was, was I thought quite too, much too simply about in the beginning is that information technology is harder than it looks. It seemed easy. Uh, IT and healthcare is getting better, but it feels like it's getting worse. And the reason it feels like it's getting worse is IT is getting so much better in the rest of our life that the juxtaposition between the clunky IT system that you have in your, in your hospital or in your clinic and your iPad and open table and Amazon is getting even more jarring over time. Uh, the early glowing studies about how good IT is and how, how easy it was to do, I think uh, came from a few institutions, including one of them in Boston, that had built it, their own system over the course of 30 years and has only limited relevance to the rest of us who are buying uh, store-bought uh, systems and airlifting them in. Uh, we've learned about un unforeseen consequences, including IT-related safety hazards. And that said, we can't be Luddites. We have to computerize. We have to work our way through this initial clunky phase. What I want to spend a moment on is some of the unanticipated consequences of IT that I, I, I hadn't guessed, but I think are turning out to be quite real and profound, and we have to really turn our attention to. This is Abraham Verghese. Abraham's uh, actually a dear friend of mine. He's a professor at Stanford, and he's a physician and a wonderful writer. You may have read Cutting for Stone, a uh, book he wrote a couple of years ago. Abraham has been talking a lot about the impact of IT on the doctor-patient relationship. And in a very important article in the New England Journal a few years ago, he wrote this. The patient is still at the center, but more as an icon for another entity clothed in binary garments, the eye patient. Often emergency room personnel have already scanned, tested, and diagnosed so that interns meet a fully formed eye patient long before they see the real patient. The eye patient's blood counts and emanations are tracked and trended like a Dow Jones index and pop-up flags remind caregivers to feed or bleed. Eye patients are handily discussed, or sometimes we call this card flipped, in the bunker, the team's conference room, while the real patients keep the beds warm and ensure that the folders bearing their names stay alive on the computer. I think it's really profound and is an amazingly important area for us to, to begin to focus on as we computerize. This, uh, you may have seen this, this was in the Journal of American Medical Association, Association last year, or earlier this year, and a pediatrician submitted a drawing that a seven-year-old girl uh, did of her visit to the doctor. And so it was sort of nice that she, she, she drew this wonderful uh, drawing of what it was like going to visit the doctor. And this was the drawing. She's sitting there on the table getting ready to be examined. Mom is there with her, uh, her baby sister. And as you see on the left side of the drawing is the, uh, the doctor is sitting there on the computer, her back facing the patient. This was the girl's impression of what the visit to the doctor was like. This should scare the hell out of all of us. And those of you who are, who are practicing clinicians know that this is an increasingly common phenomenon. The, uh, uh, the computer is insatiable. We have to spend an increasing amount of time feeding it, and we have to figure out ways to make sure that we're not getting in the way of the relationship with patients. Uh, I don't quite know how to do that yet, but it has to be a major focus. There's a second area of computerization that I think is really very important that we have to think a lot about. 
this is an Airbus. Uh, I flew one of those uh, here last night. Uh, and this is the cockpit. It's spectacular. It's got amazing technology. As you know, the plane can essentially fly itself these days. It used to be they had three people in cockpits. In the old days, there was a pilot, uh, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer. Now they're down to two. And there's a saying in aviation that in the future, there will probably not be two humans, but instead there will be a pilot and a dog. Uh, the pilot will be there to keep the dog company. The dog will be there to bite the pilot if he tries to touch the controls. <laughs> now, you could see that why that might happen. And in many ways, the safety record of aviation is extraordinarily enviable. There hasn't been a crash of an American commercial airliner in the last four years. That's a staggeringly, staggering record of safety that we would love to emulate. That said, uh, it's a little bit scary. And, and the scariness came to light with the crash several years ago of Air France 447. Some of you may know this story. This was a plane flying from Rio to Paris. Uh, it was an Airbus, incredibly, incredibly sophisticated Airbus. And at the helm was a relatively young but perfectly qualified Airbus pilot, a co-pilot, the senior pilot. They had to have three pilots because of the sleep regulations for a long flight. The senior pilot was in the back of the plane uh, sleeping as he was supposed to be. The plane took off from Brazil, was flying over the Atlantic Ocean, and they flew through a storm. And a small part that hangs off the side of the airplane, it's called the Pitotu, that's, that reads the airspeed, froze. And all of a sudden, in this cockpit, all of the data that they were used to having flowing in through all that miraculous machinery froze up. There was no more data. A lot of data, it turns out, hinged on the airspeed and was calculated off the airspeed. So for a short period of time, this pilot and his co-pilot now had to fly the plane without all of the data they were used to getting. And if you want to read a chilling, amazingly chilling article, there is a uh, essentially a minute-by-minute minute, uh, description of what happened inside that cockpit in Popular Mechanics of all places last year, where they describe what happened. It took them two years to find the black box. They finally found it in the bottom of the Atlantic. And what essentially happened was this young pilot did not know how to fly the plane without the computerized data. That the, 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 the new generation of pilots no longer was learning how to fly the planes if they weren't having all of this spectacular input and he did precisely the wrong thing. He pulled the nose up in the air to try to keep the plane aloft. That was just the wrong move, caused the plane to stall out, and he flew a, you know, tens of millions of dollars of airplane, but much more importantly, hundreds of people. Uh, the airplane was perfectly intact, other than this one tube that had frozen. He flew the plane into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, killing the entire, uh, the entire group of people on the plane. Uh, I worry a lot about this because I think as we computerize, we will be training. We're beginning to train a generation of clinicians that no longer knows how to practice when the computers are, uh, are not working well or the computers are giving them information that is not correct. And we've got to stay uh, very alert to this or we could create some real havoc. The importance of culture. This has been one of the great surprises to me as well. I'd really never given the idea of culture in healthcare a moment's thought. Those of you who trained in business, went to business schools, you've probably learned a lot about culture in, in your worlds, but it's not something we thought about in medicine. It turns out to be profoundly important. This is something uh, Gawande wrote last year. I think it captures it very well. This is particularly around the culture of physicians and the way we're trained and socialized. Atul wrote, the core structure of medicine, how healthcare is organized and practiced, emerged in an era when doctors could hold all the key information patients needed in their, in their heads and manage everything required themselves. We were craftsmen. We could set the fracture, spin the blood, plate the cultures, administer the antiserum. The nature of the knowledge lent itself to prizing autonomy, independence, and self-sufficiency, and to designing medicine accordingly. This is a perfect reflection of the way I was trained and socialized. But you can't hold the information in your head anymore, and you can't master all the skills. No one person can work up a patient's back pain, run the immunoassay, do the physical therapy, protocol the MRI, and direct the treatment of the unexpected cancer found in the spine. I don't even know what it means to protocol the MRI. I think this is extraordinarily important, and, and, and clinicians, the doctors particularly, know this. This is We're going through the sea change in, in what it means to be a great doctor. Uh, and part of the patient safety field is learning that and, and walking physicians through a new way of thinking about their work. It's extraordinarily difficult. The other things we've learned about culture really relate to this issue of authority gradients and hierarchies. This is work Brian Sexton did now a decade ago, but it's still relevant and it's been replicated. 
Brian asked members of OR crews, the, the uh, surgeons and everybody else, how good teamwork was in the OR. And what he found was fascinating. The attending surgeons, nearly 80% of them, said teamwork is terrific in my OR. I find that very comforting, because I want good teamwork in my OR if I need surgery. The problem is he asked everyone else, <laughs> the anesthesiologists, the surgical nurses, the anesthesia nurses, and lowest on the totem pole, the anesthesia residents. Showing, of course, that you never ask the leader how good teamwork is, you ask the followers. And this notion of authority gradients and hierarchies and barriers for people to speak up when they see something that might be amiss, I think is really a profound insight from the patient safety field that turns out to be very useful in other walks of life, both in medicine and, and by the way, in parenting. Uh, this is when Brian asked uh, both surgeons and, and, and pilots, do you think someone should question you if they think you're doing something wrong? Virtually every pilot, of course, says, of course, are you kidding? and half of the surgeons said no. Now, it's, you might say, oh, the surgeons are arrogant. Uh, maybe a little, I'm an internist, but, but that's not the issue here. The surgeons were enculturated, were, were socialized to believe that all of the responsibility for their patients' outcomes rested on their shoulders and did not see their work as a team sport. So one of the things that's been so important in the safety world is changing the way we think about our work as a team sport and having particularly people like Lucian, you know, highly respected surgeons come out and make that case has been extraordinarily important. The other epiphany for me about safety culture uh, came from some work that uh, Brian Sexton and Peter Pronovost did. And it really gets at this issue of where does, does your hospital or your clinic have a safety culture? Well, it turns out not really. This was a study that uh, across 100 hospitals, they did a survey of how looking at how good safety culture was. And you see there's some splay here. Some of them, it was pretty bad. 40% of them said, of people said, my hospital is a good culture. 80% said, at other places, said, I have a good culture. But look at the one hospital in black. What they did in that hospital is they then went into that hospital and did surveys of safety culture throughout the building. The ER, the ICU, labor and delivery, the step-down unit. And this is the curve of safety culture within that one hospital proving that your hospital doesn't have a safety culture, your ICU has one, and 30 feet away, the step-down unit has a completely different one. This idea of safety culture being local is, I think, very important and turns out to be quite useful because periodically, when we're looking at my own, my own place and saying we have to improve our safety culture, oh, we should change it to make it more like the Mayo Clinic. Well, that would be nice, except we're not in Rochester, Minnesota. We don't have the same structure, the same tradition. We're not paid the same way. Um, it's much easier, it turns out, to say, we have to improve it, let's do what they're doing 100 feet down the, down the floor because they're doing it well and we don't seem to have figured that out on my unit. I think it's an, actually a very important insight. I'll spend a moment or two just on this issue of the need to balance no blame and accountability. This has been one of the things I've focused on in the last few years. Let me tell you how this played out. When I read Lucian's work, when I read Jim Reason's work, of course, uh, the, in some ways the founding father of the field of safety, who talked about the Swiss cheese model and the need to focus on systems. I said, this, this makes all the sense in the world. We should be focusing on systems, not people, and therefore the right approach is no blame. We shouldn't be pointing fingers. We should be po uh, pointing at the system. And that is mostly but not completely correct. We know that most errors are slips. We know that you can only fix them by improving systems, whether it's IT or checklists. Uh, that turns out to be mostly correct. The problem is, this is, I started getting a headache about four years ago, because in one part of my brain, it was saying no blame, no blame, no blame, and another part of my brain was saying, yes, but there has to be accountability. What do we do when someone is incompetent or uh, refusing to follow perfectly reasonable safety standards? How do we approach that? And we were saying at the time, oh, no blame, that's our mantra. And it seemed silly to me. It seemed like that can't be no blame. And so I personally was struggling with how do we balance these two competing but interlocking thoughts in, in one collective brain. Uh, this is, I've, here's the Swiss cheese model. It came from Jim Reason's book, Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents. When I was in the UK last year, I had a chance to spend some time uh, with Dr. Reason. We didn't spend the whole time drinking, but, but a little bit. <laughs> He's a remarkable person. And I talked to him about this idea that people have interpreted your work as being all about no blame. And he said, 
you know, they haven't read my work carefully enough. And I went back and reread the book that the Swiss cheese model comes from. And Jim wrote this, a no blame culture is neither feasible nor desirable. A small proportion of human unsafe acts are egregious and warrant sanctions, severe ones in some cases. A blanket amnesty on all unsafe acts would lack cred credibility in the eyes of the workforce. More importantly, it would seem to oppose natural justice. What is needed is a just culture, an atmosphere of trust in which people are encouraged, even rewarded, for providing essential safety-related information, but in which they are also clear about where the line must be drawn between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So I think some people think this just culture idea was just invented a few years ago. It's actually from the very beginning of the safety field, a absolutely crucial part of Jim's thinking, and I assume Lucian's thinking as well, that in some ways got forgotten as we were so enamored of this no blame mantra. And I think it's quite important that we come up with a balanced approach. Uh, my favorite example here is hand hygiene. As you know, many places had hand hygiene rates that were abysmal 10%, 20% a decade ago. Over the last decade, many places have worked very hard on this and gotten their hand hygiene rates up, but only to 50, 60, 70%. When I go and visit a place like that and I say, how are you working to get to 90 or 100%, they say, we're approaching this as a systems problem. I say, that's nice. And then I walk around the wards, and there is a gel dispenser every two feet. And on every ward, on every floor and wall, there's a picture of a clinical leader cleaning his hands or her hands, looking like they're having the time of their life. And on every screensaver of every computer is the most disgusting pussy wound you can imagine. And I have to tell you, the system looks pretty good to me. And when they say it's a systems problem, I'm sorry, but my BS detector goes off. <laughs> because to me, that's an accountability problem. That is a problem we are not saying to anyone, OK, if you don't clean your hands, you will be suspended. You cannot work here if you don't clean your hands. And we simply have to. It's time that we begin to draw lines like this. We educate people. We make the systems as good as we can make them. But at some point, if you don't clean your hands, you should not be touching patients. It's just as simple as that. And I think we got so excited about this no blame idea that we forgot the importance of balancing that. And Lucian's written about that, and, and others have. I think it's profoundly important. So this is, I wrote an article with Peter Pronovost about this a few years ago in the New England Journal. We wrote this, no blame is not a moral imperative, even if it seems that way to providers. It most definitely does not to patients. Rather, it's a tactic to achieve ends for which providers and healthcare organizations will, I think, quite appropriately be held accountable. This is one of the sort of core questions of the maturation of maturing patient safety field is how do we get that balance right? I think it's crucially important that we do. Also important that we don't go too far. It is important that we remember that most problems are system problems. Most errors are committed by good people trying to do the right thing. But when that's not the case, we have to call it for what it is, and there has to be accountability. A uh, final point I want to make is dealing with change, and I'll do that just with one last story. Um, this is a lot of change to absorb. And if you think about life from the standpoint of a, let's say, practicing physician, this is not what you signed up for. This work in safety, teamwork, simulation, regulations, the Joint Commission, learning an IT system, you signed up for none of this. And if you think doctors in general are change averse, you have never met a more change averse person than a successful academic physician, trust me. Well, I was at a meeting a little while back, and the chair of my department was talking about this new world that we were in. We're getting measured on everything. It's all transparent. The creditor could show up on a moment's notice. Uh, we have this new computer system we're implementing. You have to learn to use it. You better clean your hands. On and on and on and on. And you could see the physicians in the audience, uh, many of whom were very successful academic physicians under the old rules, getting more and more depressed. And this gentleman, whose name is Mel Chetlin, a wonderful senior clinical cardiologist, a fantastic person and teacher, uh, but who I would have thought was one of the old guard, who would be one of the ones getting most depressed with all this, these changes in his beloved field, got up at the end of this meeting and grabbed the microphone, which is something he didn't do very much at our faculty meetings, and he said something I will never forget. He said, you know, this could be worse. And I had said, oh my god, I can't believe he's saying that. But then he went on and he said, I could be younger. Now, I, I tell you that uh, 
because I found it amusing, but I think he's wrong. I think there has never been a more exciting time to be in medicine. The idea that all of us are coming together, breaking bread and learning from each other and seeing the world from other people's eyes. I mean, what could be more interesting and what could be more important? And so I prefer to, uh, to think about my life, uh, my professional life, this way. This is in the words of uh, Don Berwick and Finkelstein who wrote this very nice article in Academic Medicine a couple of years ago, which captures the way at least I approach things. They wrote, we think that the anxiety, demoralization, and sense of loss of control that afflict all too many healthcare professionals today comes not from finding themselves as participants in systems of care, but rather finding themselves lacking the skills and knowledge to thrive as effective, proud, and well-oriented agents of change in those systems. A physician equipped to help improve healthcare will not be demoralized, but optimistic. Not helpless in the face of complexity, but empowered. Not frightened by measurement, but made curious and more interested. Not forced by culture to wear the mask of the lonely hero, but armed with confidence to make a better contribution to the whole. I think that's right. I think there's never been a more important and interesting time in healthcare, and I think you'll be reassured to know that many of the young physicians that I work with, medical students, residents, this is the way they see the world. They see that they are being given a challenge, a profound challenge, to figure out a way to deliver the highest quality, safest, most satisfying care at the lowest cost. And they sometimes ask us, what were you people trying to do? <laughs> that seems like a perfectly reasonable charge. And they have embraced this in a way that I think is a little bit harder for those of us that didn't think that this was our charge, but I think it's incredibly important work. We can only achieve it working in a partnership with all sorts of other folks who come at this work from, uh, from different vantage points. And as I thought about my little index card and what I want to work on, I want more people to think about, more clinicians to think about their professional calling in this way, to recognize how important, how exciting it is, and to recognize that we'll only get it done if we work together. Thank you so much for having me.